As the facilitator in the debrief, our primary concern is creating a safe, non-judgmental atmosphere for people to express the thoughts, feelings, and symptoms that can emerge after an event. We base this on the critical incident stress debriefing model so that we can take it that step for further and discuss healing, coping skills, available resources, and normalize what they've experienced so that they can go forward and understand this is a natural reaction to what is sometimes a very traumatic and unnatural event. So thank you guys for coming here today. My name is Erin O'Donnell and I'm a counselor. Um, and along with me is Allie, who's a part of your peer support team. And we're coming together today to talk about what happened um, just the other day in the emergency room. I understand that there was a tragic loss, uh, which I know you face frequently, but this one seemed to really hit home. So I want to take uh, today, and we're going to do a little bit of a debriefing of what happened. So, so the, the way that we start that is that first we're going to go around and, um, and I'd like for each of you to share just a little bit, a general overview of the facts based on your experience. So um, if you don't want to share, if you don't feel like that, um, that you can share today in the moment, that's okay. You can just pass today if you wouldn't like to. So, so maybe, maybe we could start right here. Sure. Um, first, it was a pretty typical day in the ER, um, but we got a trauma call um, and we found out that it was a drunk driving accident and there had been a mom and a child who had been pretty severely injured. Um, and I was responsible for taking care of the two of them and it was just horrible. It, they were, it was just terrible and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't save them. I tried everything I could think of and I just, I couldn't save them. It was terrible. And then. I had to go talk to the husband and tell him that they didn't survive, um, and it was just heartbreaking. And for you, what would be the the thought if you? Oftentimes, there's a thought that um, is the loudest in our heads at the time, or we repeat over and over again. What would be that first thought that you recall um, having that kind of salience occur? I think it's just. That this is so unfair. It's just, I mean, this f mom and child were just driving along. They didn't think anything was going to happen, and now they're dead. And I, I couldn't save them. And it's just, it's a horrible feeling. And they didn't deserve this. And because of one person's choice, now their, their lives are gone. And their husband is, and their husband is just distraught. It's horrible. It's just unfair. It's all I can think in my head is it's just unfair. So Iris, for you, could you maybe give us a little general overview of the, the facts of the experience that you had there on that day? Um, it's really hard for me because I'm new in this job and um, for me it was very traumatizing and it's the first time that I've experienced death and seen, um, seen death with my eyes and it's most, not one but two people and a little girl. So I prefer not to go into details as I'm still in shock right now. I can't talk about it. Okay. So, Susan, you could share with us um, your experiences on that day. Well, um, again, I'm the, probably one of the senior nurses in the ER. I'm also precepting Iris. And um, to, as you know, we go through this it's um, not a common occurrence, but each one can really take um, a lot out of you. And so basically my role was to take care, help her. We took care of the family. And then um, I also went over to take care of the man that caused the accident. And that's where emotions can get really strong too. I didn't take Iris with me because I felt there was enough going on. And for you, what was the first thought or the strongest thought that you remember having or that repeated over and over in your head? For me, um, being in the room with the um, drunk driver and hearing Melinda, I knew Melinda had just broken the news to the father because there's this horrible scream that families do when they realize they've lost someone. 
And I think that's what truly has shaken me to the core of the auditory um, versus the visual. Mm -hmm. So, the deep sensory. Yeah, I'm, I'm more sensory. Like the yeah. deep sensory piece. Yeah. So we go around. Would you like to share your, the first thought that you had that you remember having, having that that sticks out in your mind, perhaps the loudest thought? Oh, I can't. I can't talk about this. It's been. I don't think I'm ready for this. I'll go make sure she's all right. Great, thank you. So Allie's, Allie's going to go with Iris and, um, and offer her some, some support. Um, while she's doing that, um, I'd like to, like to continue on, if that's okay with you. I think for me it's auditory. When Melinda had to go and tell the father, that they both were um, gone, and there's something about that, how that families do, that carries with me. Mm -hmm. So I notice, like at home, if the TV's on and I hear laughing, I get real um, agitated. Like, how can you be laughing? Right, you know, right. everybody has to. Why aren't they feeling like I am? You know, that kind of, and also for Iris, because when that occurred. Um, although I was near her, I almost felt mothering, like I wanted to spare her and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. So I think some of that's with me too, being her preceptor, how do I handle, besides myself, um, a young nurse. You're worried for her. Yeah, that's yeah. Because she's at a spot she's going to be because it's so new, you know. Of course. I wish she could do more and, and could reverse the course of time and somehow made it not happen the way that it did. That's a normal feeling. That's, that's grief. You know, that's a part of the grief process. And you know, and, and it's important through this to come together, to talk, to share, to seek support if you need it, and also to do self-care. To know that that is okay. To do the self-care. So we've talked a little bit about some of the, the effects can, that, that can happen. What do you feel like for you has been um, the way in which this might be interfering with your normal life course? Maybe your sleep, maybe your appetite um, has changed. Maybe it's more challenging to engage in some of the things that you normally enjoy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I definitely am having trouble sleeping, but I, I feel like I can't do anything fun. Like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing anything fun. You know, just like Sue said, she hears someone laughing, and, and I, you know, it makes me mad, or I feel like I don't deserve to go to the movies or do something, you know, with my family that is fun, because I have a beautiful family still, and this family is now torn apart, and I just, I feel like I can't be kind to myself in that way, because somebody else has been suffering. It's hard to, hard to get over that. Hard to put that piece of self-care and make that okay again. Right, right. Like it's just, it's hard to go have a good time when you were thinking about that and know that someone else is not. Yeah, I notice. Um, for me, I've learned in some ways to like not go to the mall or something too noisy. Again, I think for me, it's auditory that um, I tend to take walk. I try not to climb into a shell, like try to get out, but go for walks, take the car, go somewhere that I like to go that's not as um, overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So that, um, and just take that time. And uh, I think allowing it to happen, um, I'm more prone to eating when I'm stressed. <laughs> so um, making sure, you know, Although I might want to eat, I've learned too to eat properly. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to go on, you know, um, to try to comfort in that way. And to also know to help Melinda, um, it does get better, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's there for a while. And I think the good part for, for me, I find coming to work, which I hope I'll be able to help with Iris, um, it almost feels like you're with the people who have been through it. So they understand, um, and my plan for Iris is to reassign us for a while so we're not on that trauma hall um, and let her see a lot of
basically normal um, events. Again, normal can change, but and to regroup her, yeah. Yeah, and what I like about what you're saying there, sometimes we do have to give ourselves permission to take a step back for a little time yeah. and, and, and do something a little bit different and focus to allow some of the healing to occur before we step back into the fire as it were. So um, why don't we take a moment and just kind of go around because although it can feel very difficult to engage in self-care and to, to feel like that's a priority, uh, it is important. It's a part of how you will move beyond, beyond this and that's okay to move beyond this because you do have family and other people to care for and this is a, this is a tragic part of life but it, it will get better. I want to keep you strong through that process. So um, what is something that you might do for self-care? Well, I'm actually really glad that you mentioned, Sue, going somewhere that's not noisy or not a lot of people. I think that is one of the things for me is I don't want to see other people being happy and I don't want to, I mean, it's fine, but it just brings up that feeling that I should have done something to save this family. But going to a place that's quiet that I like, like maybe going on a walk in, a, in one of the parks near my house that I really like to do, that would be nice to be able to get out and bring my daughter and my husband with me and then you know, we can have a nice time together but it doesn't have to be around all of these other people and I think that's a, probably a good way to, to get started at least. And I think um, what I think is a gift is that we have people like you now who come and let us have these feelings and um, not to be Pollyanna, but I'm old enough to know how it used to be. Mm -hmm. And we used to couldn't talk about it or you mm -hmm. couldn't and we were all struggling in our own little cocoons. And now like, you know, for the, us to all be together with also our coworkers who maybe didn't come today mm -hmm. to keep checking in. Mm -hmm. That's part of my self healing, like I feel like I check, I hope to check in on people and make sure, and I know, um, you know, life gets better, mm -hmm. um, but the tools given to us helps mm -hmm. because you don't know what, no one knows how to act. And I think you scare yourself. You think, am I all right? You know. Mm -hmm. So for you, it's social connection. Yeah. And that is an important piece, as much as sometimes we might want to go into that cocoon as you said, trying to stay stay connected and be of support to each other. And part of your support network here is your peer support team, which you know Allie is involved with, and you have other members, and those are a great resource for you to go to for support. And I have their brochures here. Um, I'll make sure to give one to Iris. And, and you have um, my contact information, so you can reach out for your own individual support in a confidential way, and you can also seek out your peer support members who are in the trenches with you and, and can have that conversation. Um, any final thoughts or, or questions?